everybody to today's Law of Self-Defense show. Thank you very much for joining me today. We have a very special show and a very special guest for all of you. Before we start, of course, I am attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. At least I hope we have a special guest. I sent her to the guest invite and she's not on board yet. Uh, but hopefully she gets here momentarily. But we are here to talk about the lawsuit that's just been filed against Sig Sauer, the firearms company, over its, uh, some would say, much maligned, others would say defective pistol, the P320 model of pistol. And I have a, a few disclaimers to share before we dig into all of this. One is that uh, I today carry a SIG pistol for personal protection. It's not the 320, it's the 365 XL. But for many years, five or six years, I did carry a SIG P320 every day for personal protection. I own several of the pistols, uh, so I have some personal familiarity with them. I, I started buying those pistols with the first generation, the, the moment they came out. And I must have, I don't know, three or four of them uh, by now. Uh, and I have versions that have gone through the um, recall process for some of these uh, mechanical issues that were claimed with the gun. So I have experience with both the pre-recall, the post-recall, and, and some of the added safety feature options uh, that were later made available on the gun as well. So I, I have some personal experience. That said, I am not a SIG armorer. I am not a pistol designer. So take my limited expertise uh, and experience with the gun for what it is. Uh, hopefully that experience will add some insight to uh, this lawsuit. Second, I should also say that uh, I've had a great professional and personal experience with SIG over the years. For about a decade, I was an adjunct instructor at the SIG Sauer Academy. For most of those years, it was called the SIG Arms Academy before they changed the name. Um, I was, of course, my subject matter expertise was use of force laws, you might imagine. Uh, and they were very generous as uh, in allowing their adjunct instructors, including myself, uh, to basically be able to take any of the courses, the shooting courses they offered, uh, which was a, an enormous variety then, an even bigger variety now. The academy's only grown tremendously in sky uh, in size uh, since then. Uh, I believe they even have satellite academies now around the country. Uh, so it, it provided me with an unbelievable opportunity to take all kinds of normally police only and military only training courses. Uh, that otherwise I would never have had access to. And I'm forever grateful to, uh, to SIG for enabling me to do that. And I see Danny's just coming to the, uh, the, the green room here, so I'll bring her up in a moment. So uh, I, I have nothing but positive feelings towards SIG. Um, just full disclosure on all of that. Uh, before I bring Danny up, I am going to mention the sponsor of today's content, which is, of course, none other than Law of Self-Defense in particular, our American law courses. Many of you will be familiar with Steve Gosney, attorney Steve Gosney, common guest on many of the LawTuber shows, personal friend of mine. Steve's just finishing up. The, this week is the last class in his fall semester criminal law class um, under our American law courses umbrella, where we teach American law at a law school level, but in plain English for normal people who'd like the knowledge, but don't want to spend the time and money and endure the politics of today's law school environment. Uh, so we teach traditional American law in the traditional American way. We're just finishing criminal law. In the spring, we have two new courses. One is our evidence class. Uh, that's being taught by attorney Ryan Ballinger. Great class. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, I urge you to take a look at that URL to learn more about it. And I see that we accidentally left up the Cyber Monday sale. So if you, if you grab it before I get my staff to fix that, you'll save yourself quite a bit of money. You can learn more about that at lawselfdefense.com slash Evidence Law, and we also have our property course being taught by none under none other than LawTuber Andrew Esquire himself, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And you can learn more about this course at lawselfdefense.com slash property law. And now I would like to bring up, like to bring up our guest for today. Danny, Danny on. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you so much for having me. When I got your uh, your tweet, I was just kind of, you know, trying to get out of bed and get ready. So it worked out really well. I, I I spent way too much time having fun on my first live stream last night and drank a little bit too much. So if my oh. mental acuity isn't quite there, I apologize in advance. 
No worries, no worries. I found that I've had to uh, temper uh, my own participation in many of the uh, the late night uh, alcohol fueled uh, streams because it it can easily consume the entire next day. Uh, just getting over the uh, very fun but uh, uh, resource intensive uh, live streams late in the evening. Very much so. so. Now I will confess I have not read through any part of the complaint, so I'm excited. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. We'll just do a cold. It's not that complicated, really. I mean, there's there's probably ten substantive pages in the whole thing. A lot of it is just repetitive complaints um, and injuries because there's twenty or so plaintiffs uh, listed here. Uh, So most of that we're going to skip through. It's 150 pages long, but most of most of it is repetitive. But I wanted you on because, uh, of course, I found this of interest because of my past relationship with Sig as as an instructor at their academy. Uh, I've carried SIG pistols for many years, including the pistol that's being sued over here uh, for many years. Uh, But my expertise is use of force law. It's not civil suits against companies. The stuff I I, I do know about civil suits is largely based on what I learned in law school, which I graduated from in 1991. So quite some time ago. Uh, So I know you have expertise as a civil litigator. So that's why I extended the invitation. I'm so glad you were able to take it at such short notice because I just decided to do the show at the very last minute. Oh, well, I really appreciate it. And hopefully I have something substantive and uh, useful to add. I mean, I'm assuming this is a products liability case. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and I, I want to make that clear to everybody, too. Let me pull up a, a, uh, an image here of the pistol in question. I would I would just show you one of mine, except uh, uh, YouTube does not like it when you show actual guns on uh on their live stream. So this is what it looks like, folks. It's just, uh, it does come in a variety of different versions. The barrel can be longer, the slide, the top part can be longer, the grip can be longer or shorter, uh, the slide can be longer or shorter. And this is kind of the basic concealed carry version of this pistol. Um, this is the kind I've carried as well as a number of other versions of it. Uh, some of the versions are, are really important and are rele- relevant to the legal is- issues in this case, by the way, and I'll highlight those as we get to them. But this is it. It's just a kind of a run-of-the-mill plastic frame striker fired pistol, uh, except the plaintiffs here claim it does something a pistol is not supposed to do, and that is fire when the wielder does not want the gun to fire, uh, unintentionally discharged, resulting in, as might be imagined, Uh, undesired injuries as a result. Uh, Now, I do want to make clear, this appears to me to be a straight up products liability case. So it's not one of these lawsuits that we sometimes see from the gun control community that want to hold uh, gun manufacturers responsible for criminal acts committed with their guns, which would make about as much sense as holding Ford responsible for drunk drivers misusing their vehicles, right? Those, Those suits are insane, ought have no basis in law at all. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a, a group of people, some 20 odd people who either were themselves injured or their spouses of the people who were injured and have their own claims, they allege, uh, because of what they say is a defective product, this defective P320 uh, pistol that fires when the holder doesn't want it to fire. So I asked Danny on so we could kind of just cold. I haven't really read the the uh, filing detail either, but just kind of cold step through it. And there's a number of civil suit specific concepts discussed in here that I wanted Danny to be able to bring expertise to. But before we do that, Danny, why don't you introduce yourself uh, as well as where people can find you? Because I, I did put the link to your YouTube channel and your Twitter in the in the comments or whatever they call that field uh, below the video. So folks can find it there. Um, but Danny just started her YouTube channel. I think she just had a thousand subscribers right yesterday or the day before. Um, so it's growing fast. But of course, we want it to grow faster. And most important, she needs views. Right now, to be able to monetize, you need viewing hours. So one thing we're going to do, folks, if you're watching this live, you're watching it on my Law Self-Defense YouTube channel. And of course, afterwards, the replay will be available. But I'm also going to send Danny the recording, the video file for this. So she can post it up on her own channel, too, and hopefully drive more view hours or whatever the metric is to get her to a point where she can begin monetizing her channel as well. Uh, So that's also one of the reasons I wanted to get around. But Danny, before we go any further, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Hello, audience. Um, I'm an attorney in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I just finished a unsuccessful run for Salt Lake County District Attorney. Um, I was not a prosecutor prior to running, uh, which isn't saying much because my opponent also had never tried a capital case or anything to that effect. As a matter of fact, I don't believe he's ever tried a felony. So it's not that you have to be a prosecutor. As a matter of fact, it's beneficial to be a civil litigator, which is what I was. So my bread and butter was civil litigation prior to running. Um, I practiced law mostly in family law. 
uh, someone generously made the suggestion that I change my name to Lawfordite and uh, take on family law cases, which I may do. Actually, I think I think there is some interest there. I get I mean, even when I was running, a lot of people had a lot of questions about family law and how it operates and asking for my representation. So uh, that's that's a little bit about me. Um, I studied. Uh, well, I also took on general litigation cases. So contract disputes, uh, property disputes, you name it, whatever paid is what I worked on. Um, and then prior to that, I was uh, I worked at the State Department. I worked for the governor's office, our, our governor, uh, with his general counsel. So my I, I've kind of walked this uh, public and private interest area for a while. But that's a little bit about me. I, I speak Korean. My husband is from Korea. I am married. Um, I'm I'm just getting it out of the way because everybody always asks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to I was going to mention it if you didn't because the simp's go crazy otherwise. <laughs> And uh, my my contribution so far, right now at least, is looking at that photo. That looks like the gun that cops use. Am I wrong? Very common, very common service okay. pistol. In fact, it was recently adopted also by the U.S. military, although in a different, importantly, different configuration. Uh, but yes, it's been a very, very successful pistol for SIG. They've sold, I don't know, but it must be millions of them at this point. A direct competitor with the Glock, which is also a very common police service pistol. They're basically this is they basically perform exactly the same function, same caliber, same basic firing mechanism, some safety differences that are relevant here. Uh, 17 to 19 rounds, full-size service pistol or slightly smaller for detective carry, uh, but direct competitors with the Glock 19, Glock 17 pistols. Is it so, cheaper uh, than a Glock? I think they're in the same price range. Five, okay. 600 bucks would be the civilian price. I mean, the law enforcement price is is a fraction of that. They're, they're actually unbelievably inexpensive to make, to manufacture. Uh, but on the civilian market, they're in the five to $600 range. All right. And are Glocks also inexpensive and easy to manufacture as well? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Especially now they've been making them so long. I mean, the, the whole frame is basically, you know, injected plastic. Uh, the slide is metal, but, you know, once you have the CNC, the automated machinery up for that, the incremental cost to make another one is I've heard it it actually costs the company like or something around fifty dollars to manufacture one of these pistols. Okay. Uh, the, the markup is pretty darn good, and I think they sell them to law enforcement for something like half uh, the uh, civilian price. So that would be a two hundred fifty three hundred dollar price for the pistol, which is pretty darn inexpensive. Can I um, grift uh, your law classes? As a matter of fact, here really quick. So sure. Speaking of uh, uh, inexpensive gun manufacturing, my friend, she just told me when when I had left law school, I was the president of the Federalist Society. She took over after I left and they hosted a debate on 3D printed guns. And the dean of the law school um, required additional security in the building because she thought for some reason that they were going to manufacture a 3D printed gun right there. I mean, it's just so <laughs> indicative of the ignorance in law schools, especially, uh, well, I can't say liberal law schools, all law schools are liberal. So I highly recommend that you check out uh, his classes. I'm sure I would have learned a lot more had I had I sat through one of them. So there yeah, you go. We have a we actually have a new website going up for the courses, but you can you can still go to the uh, the existing website. Um, law of self defense.com slash law courses will take you to an overview of everything we're doing with all the courses. And of course, this spring is evidence law and property law are what we'll be running. All right, so let's just let me pull up the uh, the filing here, and we'll just start kind of rolling through it. Uh, and now, of course, I'm controlling the rolling, so you, you just tell me anytime you want to stop. A lot of it is repetitive, so I'll kind of just be uh, scrolling through it. In fact, I, I made little. Uh, where's my piece of paper? My little page numbers notes. So I know how far I can scroll each time. There we go. Andrew, you and I, were, I, I was going to say, I learned from Jeff because I, I frustrated the heck out of Jeff when I've been on his streams. I always interrupt him while he's talking. So I've started to oh, take no. notes so that I remember, you know, what I want to refer back to. Yeah, don't don't worry about interrupting me. I'm, I don't take it personally. I One of the great criticisms I get is that I, uh, I talk over people, but it's just because I'm from New York. It's nothing personal. It's. <laughs> I didn't know you're from New York. Well, that makes sense why I like you so much. So there you no. go. There we go. All right. So let me make this bigger. Whoop, no too big. Or however they say it. Yeah. So uh, Sig Sauer as a company is headquartered in, in New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, obviously not all. These are all the plaintiffs here, the people claiming injury. 
either directly or because they're spouses. Uh, the spouses, of course, are claiming loss of consortium here. And uh, Danny can talk about what that is when we get to that. There's about 20 of them listed here. It's quite a number from all over the country. Um, and I do want to spend some time going through. So some of this, I'll basically just be reading the filing. These in initial claims, I think, do a nice job of framing what it is the plaintiffs are claiming here and what they're seeking. So the plaintiffs in this action are a group of highly trained and experienced firearms and users whose lives were upended by a dangerously defective pistol, the Sig Sauer P320. Now, Ooh, I love how they frame that. That's great yeah. because they're already they're already anticipating this this idea of unreasonable use or using it in a way that's unexpected or unanticipated by the manufacturer. Right, because any gun can discharge then if it's being handled negligently. In fact, Glocks were were famous for this because uh, many older guns have uh, a lot of external safeties on them, levers, thumb safeties, pistol grip safeties that need to be activated or deactivated in order for the gun to fire. Uh, but when Glocks were designed, they were specifically designed to be like revolvers. And revolvers don't typically have any external safety mechanism. The safety mechanism is just the, the trigger weight of the trigger, uh, how much effort it takes to pull. But you just point a revolver and you depress the trigger and it fires uh, if it's loaded. Uh, and Glock was... When Glock came out, the dominant service pistol for police officers were still revolvers. So they were competing against revolvers. They wanted a gun that you could also just point, press the trigger, the gun would discharge. Uh, now, Glock did put a number of internal safeties, what they call internal safeties inside the gun. I'll talk about those in a moment when we get to that part of this motion. Uh, and some of those SIG did not include in their own gun. That's a point of contention here. Uh, but there's no external levers on a Glock. There's nothing that you have to hit extra besides the trigger in order to make the gun discharge, which means if something gets caught in the trigger, for example, like a, a, a string from a jacket, or, uh, or you leave your thumb inadvertently in the trigger guard while you're holstering the gun, well, that'll depress the trigger, and that's all that's required for the gun to discharge. So certainly one of the... And by the way, folks, I should say up front, I have no idea if these guns are defective or not, right? I'm not an engineer... Uh, these are the claims of the plaintiffs. Maybe there's a problem. Maybe there's not a problem. I can share my history with the recalls on this gun and things like that because I went through that personally. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't have any absolute knowledge about whether or not the guns are defective or not. That, that'll have to be argued. But certainly a non-defective gun can unintentionally discharge if the person handling it is doing so in a negligent manner. So right in this first sentence, they're emphasizing they've chosen. You choose your plaintiffs carefully if you have the option to do that, uh, to to uh, offset these kinds of counter arguments. And they deliberately chose a group of plaintiffs who are, they say here, highly trained and experienced firearms users, police, military, and civilians who, uh, through their own self-interest, own interest, have acquired a great deal of expertise in firearms. Let's see. Upon the information discovered through research and document production, the Sig Sauer 320 is the most dangerous pistol for its users sold in the United States market. Uh, it's a big it's a claim. Very bold claim. <laughs> uh, I will say that virtually all pistols are about as safe as you can make them today. Uh, I mean, the the design, the engineering, the manufacture of guns is really stellar. Uh, they they really don't they just don't go off by themselves, which is why this is such a remarkable claim that Sig actually the claim that Sig put out a pistol on the market that could in fact do that. Gun modern guns don't generally do that. So it's almost more a testament here to all the other guns <laughs> that are right. that are so as safe as you can make something that's supposed to fire a slug of lead at high velocity um, compared to what they're claiming is the problem with the SIG. Uh, the plaintiffs in this action are federal law enforcement agents, police officers, combat veterans, detectives, firearms instructors, and civilians who have dedicated significant portions of their lives to the safe use of weapons. That's emphasizing the same point we already touched on. Uh, the plaintiffs in this action trusted trusted Six Hour to live up to its reputation as a designer and manufacturer of safe and reliable handguns. Uh, plaintiffs in this action trusted Six Hour to live up to its promise that the P320, quote unquote, would not fire unless it want you want it to. That's that's language directly from SIG's advertising copy uh, for this. Well, and that's the reasonable expectation part of the claim that they're trying right. to set up here. They're saying, look, it was reasonable for the plaintiffs to believe that this was going to act the way that it was going to, because one, you said it would. And two, it has a reputation that it does. So they're you to, they're starting to develop their claims by use of the allegations in the complaint so far. Very well done. And uh, and of course, you know, I've mentioned in other conversations we've had that 
I think it was just on Jess stream, we were talking about the fact that the state and a prosecution get, is the first to speak to the jury, the last to speak to the jury before the jury is instructed, and how powerful an opportunity that is to frame the entire argument. And of course, that's exactly what these plaintiff's attorneys are doing here. They're using, this is really the first page of this document, first substantive page once we got past the list of plaintiffs. And they're doing a great job of framing this out for the court that's going to read this. Is this a national law firm, I take it, that's taking on this since it's a... I, I, I don't know, to tell you the truth. We can look at the, when we get to the bottom, they have their signatures. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just, I'm really impressed. I think the writing is great here, so. Yeah, I mean, of course it's in federal court. I mean, that's... It would in, not indicate that it's probably a larger firm and right. nas national, so. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's see. Um, plaintiffs in this action were lied to and let down by Sig Sauer, falling victim to the dangerously designed and manufactured P320. So let me let me talk a little bit here about what the design defect is that it's claimed. Uh, for soon after the P320 came out, there began to be news reports of incidents in which the P320 would be dropped and it would strike on the back of the slide, uh, just above where your hand would go, and the gun would discharge. Now that's not supposed to happen. There's supposed to be safety mechanisms built into the gun to prevent the gun from discharging if it's simply dropped to the ground. Um, and SIG has some of those safety mechanisms built in, but apparently they were not working correctly. At least one company, one company, one YouTube channel uh, actually did a video where they loaded blanks in a SIG pistol and dropped it and it would go off when it hit the ground and they captured this on video. Uh, that's wow. not supposed to happen. Since then, the claims have gotten worse. Since then, the claims have become, uh, listen, you don't even need to drop it. It can just go off in the holster by itself. Like vibration will disengage the safety mechanisms. The gun will simply discharge. So walking. What's that? So if you're walking and you have it in your holster, it could go off. If you set it down at the shooting and, range, any, it could go off. Any, so anything. Fact, SIG added a, a a word to their caution in their manual. They had added language saying, hey, if you drop this, it could go off, which is pretty alarming by itself. And then they added, or even vibration. Vibration can make this happen. Well, we all live in vibration. We're all, if you're carrying the gun, you're, you're moving all the time, right? You're in cars, you're in vehicles, you're walking around. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's not a good thing. There shouldn't be any circumstances in which the gun discharges unless you're intentionally or I guess inadvertently pressing the trigger. But if you're inadvertently pressing the trigger, that's on you. That's not a design defect. But if the trigger is not being manipulated and the gun goes off, there's a there's a serious problem here. Now, I don't know if that's true. Obviously, these are the plaintiff's claims, right? It's quite possible that every single of these plaintiffs who described their injuries were in fact injury, injured because they negligently handled the gun. We don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, but the claim is that the gun simply went off by itself. Uh, let's see. Uh, so they were lied to. Then we have this long list of all the plaintiffs and their various spouses. The spouses are essentially uh, suing for, I'll highlight it here, loss of consortium. You want to tell the audience what loss of consortium is, Danny? Yeah. So that means that they can't do the dirty, um, which, and it's not just they can't do the dirty. There's also levels to that, right? Whether or not there's they can actually function as a, a functioning couple, right? Or do they, are there, is their relationship um, severely impacted as a result of what's happened, um, generally in the terms of, of physical affections, right? So if you've been, if you have no longer can be physically intimate with your, with your partner, then you have had, you, you have a claim for loss of consortium. Right. And just to be clear, it doesn't necessarily mean anyone shot their junk off. Uh, it could mean someone was paralyzed. They can't engage in the, um, sexual act uh, could mean that they they shot themselves through the leg and suffered so much muscle and nerve damage that it's painful it's for them painful to undergo health. right the the physical act of having sex with their spouse so that would be the loss of consortium um and it's not an uncommon claim it happens all the time if the, the victim of uh, of negligent conduct is married and uh, the spouse loses that ability to have sex with their husband or wife any longer loss of consortium is a common uh, claim in these kinds of uh, injury cases. So they go through all the plaintiffs here. Uh, jurisdiction is in New Hampshire. This is in federal court. This is a federal statute, uh, jurisdictional statute. Um, any reasons why they might want to go to federal court, not just stay in state court? Because uh, one, I think they the federal courts generally know what they're doing with these types of cases. Two, it's a, um, it's a joint lawsuit so, or a uh, words. I have them. I'm so sorry, Bronca. No, it's all right. 
oh, what kind of case is this? Is it when a bunch of plaintiffs get together? I'm not sure it's a class action. Uh, that would be much bigger. Uh, I wonder if it could be, though. And I wonder if they're setting it up to be a class action. That, I think, um, is quite possible because this will get press now, right? This will get media coverage, right. just like we're covering it. They're starting here with 20. Uh, are we going to start seeing, uh, you know, ads being run in, in gun magazines or on the Internet saying, hey, if you if you know someone or you've been injured by a P320, call this number. You may be entitled to compensation. And well, that's and that how you really build these class action pools right and that's that's where we get to damages and so it may be that uh, they're not limited in damages in the way that they would be suing within the state with a state court too so there's there's multiple advantages to going to federal court um if you can i i highly recommend it depending on the case sorry my, my local fire department got a call obviously i tell you man i'm never getting an office in a city center again <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got the fire department two blocks away and i got the train line a block away. It's, All right. It's sort of funny how how employers want their employees to come back to work, and they think that their work environment, their office environment, is conducive to actual work. Oh, I can't um, blame anyone but me. I'm my employer. <laughs> I I even picked the office. <laughs> we yeah, just I don't think I office. could ever work downtown. I would lose my mind. Uh, all right. Uh, also, many states may have limits on um, recovery. The, yeah, in terms of uh, puni not punitive damages, but it's punitive um, damages, yeah, and right, right, okay. compensatory damages, and yep. also strict liability laws. They may be trying, and there may also be defenses to a lot of their claims in state law that are not available to the defense in the in federal court. So right. you kind of have to look at all of your options and then decide which is which is the best route to go. Yeah, a couple of other issues we saw here is a lot of the plaintiffs are not in New Hampshire, uh, so they'd be outside right. the jurisdiction of the state. You can get around that in federal court. Also, civil cases in, in state court can often take years and years and years uh, to actually come to trial because the states are obliged. The states all also carry a heavy criminal load uh, and they're obliged to provide priority to the criminal cases. So the civil cases get you know second billing in terms of getting scheduled uh, for trial that I've, I've heard that's better in federal court. But again, I don't do civil cases, so I get the priority. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So general allegations. Uh, Sig Sauer designs and manufactures firearms for sale to military and commercial markets, uh, the U.S. and internationally, sold through dealers. Um, its CEO has been Ron Cohen uh, for the relevant period. When I first started teaching at Sig Sauer, they had a different CEO. But uh, hmm. oh, my gosh. And how you long guys can hear this, that, right? You can hear the fire engine. How long has this model been in production again? Uh, let's see if they say here. I'm sure they'll get to it, but yeah, I oh, missed the multiple. It's at least a decade. So. Where you have where you have uh, plaintiffs all in multiple jurisdictions, you're going to end up in federal court. Let's see. When was it first made? 2014. 2014. Okay, so so he's our CEO during the time that this model has been in production. Yep. Okay. And uh, let's see, now I, here we go. So yeah, the gun's been made for quite some time. Uh, let's see, uh, the six hour P320 is susceptible to unintended discharges, meaning instances when the gun fires without user intent at an alarmingly high rate. Again, that's a claim by the plaintiffs. Uh, there have been over a hundred incidents and likely multiples more of the six hour unintentionally discharging when the user believed they did not pull the trigger many of which have caused severe injury to users and or bystanders, as you might expect. The vast majority of these users are law enforcement officers, former military and or trained and certified gun owners. Uh, I don't know what a certified gun owner is. Um, there's we don't really do that in America. If you're just a civilian, uh, maybe they meet people with concealed carry permits or people who've taken some kind of gun safety course, got a certificate for a gun safety course. Uh, at all relevant times, Six Hour was acting by and through yeah, its employees, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this action seeks actual compensatory and enhanced compensatory damages and equitable relief relating to the defendant Six Hour, Inc., uh, their negligence, defective design, and unfair and deceptive marketing practices regarding a firearm. Uh, we'll see some of that marketing they included in the filing here. It specifically says this gun won't go off unless you want it to go off. Uh, specifically, this matter involves a striker-fired pistol known as the P320 that has that has fired without the trigger being pulled or deliberately actuated by the user on numerous civilians and law enforcement agents across the nation. 
uh, prior to the incidents detailed below, meaning prior to these plaintiffs being injured, Sig Sauer received multiple complaints and notifications of P320 pistols firing when the trigger was either not pulled or not deliberately actuated by the user in its safety without compromise marketing materials for the 320 Sig promises. We've designed safety elements into every necessary feature on this pistol from the trigger to the striker and even the magazine. The P320 won't fire unless you want it to. So this is what people relied on when they bought this pistol, this representation uh, from SIG. This is why you need legal to review all of your marketing materials as a company, period. And you better make sure it's true. <laughs> it be, it better be true. really, really true. And even then, you should always put a little asterisk on the end that says, hey, by the way, there are some cases which are detailed in the user instruction manual in which this claim could be not true. Right. Even if they just added here, comma, when properly handled, <laughs> that would make right. a huge difference, right? Yep, yep. Very small, small word changes. Let's avoid some liability. But anyway. Let's see. Despite this express representation, which SIG has made for the last several years to the present, the weapon lacks industry standard safety features and has fired without the user deliberately pulling the trigger many, many times. A defendant had knowledge long before the sale of the 320 used by plaintiffs that the 320, its first ever striker fired pistol, was capable of firing unintentionally due to defective components and or the lack of necessary safety features, including but not limited to a manual safety, a tabbed trigger safety, a decocker, a hinged trigger, and or a grip safety. So folks, I'm not going to go through all of those various safety features, but I'll, I'll just to, for illustrative purposes. So this is the standard 320 we've already looked at. Uh, they talk here in the filing about a thumb safety. When the 320 was initially produced, it had no thumb safety. It was this gun in the upper left here, just a blank spot there on the frame. The military was looking at this pistol for military purposes, and they put it through exhaustive testing. Uh, the filing here claims the military had 200 malfunctions with the gun, but they don't say exactly what kind of malfunctions. They don't say it was, you know, dropped and discharged malfunctions, but the military did insist that a manual safety was added to this gun. They wouldn't buy it without a manual safety. That manual safety looks like the one on the right here. Um, the SIGs I've bought and carried, I only bought the ones that had the manual safety because I've, I've most of my career carrying a gun, the gun had a manual safety and it was a feature I was comfortable with and I, I liked the additional safety increment it gave me. Uh, it just happened the, the thumb safety became available because the military insisted that one be developed for them. So SIG made it generally available to the public, but they didn't put it on every pistol. They didn't, uh, you know, recall pistols and add it. Uh, so the suggestion here would be, well, listen, if the military thought that thumb safety was important, why didn't they put it on every gun? But they didn't. You had to actually specifically special order the thumb safety versions of these pistols from the factory. That's what I had to do. Well, and uh, the I don't know if it's the defense is going to argue that, you know, the military has specialized uses for this, that a civilian population, um, including law enforcement, may not. And so it doesn't produce the same utility. And because it's it's removing the whole purpose of the weapon, um, it's a feature that they decided not to include on their civilian firearms, which they can uh, absolutely. That's not a bad argue. argument because their their primary competitor. Let me pull it up here. So now we're looking at the the same SIG without the thumb safety in the upper left, and a Glock, their primary competitor in the lower right. Glock also does not have a thumb safety, has never had a thumb safety. Um, and so SIG probably thought, well, if Glock doesn't need it for civilian or police use, there's no reason we should add it to our gun. It just adds cost and complexity. And by the way, a lot of uh, very, very high quality uh, self-defense instructors, tactical instructors, pistol instructors, strongly recommend against thumb safeties for personal defense of guns because it's an additional step that has to be carried out in order to use the gun in self-defense. And the, the bad guy may not give you the time you need to operate right. the thumb safety, in which case, if you don't operate the thumb safety, the gun doesn't work, right? That's the purpose of the thumb safety. Uh, so it's common for uh, trainers to recommend against guns with a thumb safety. I carried one again because for 25 years prior, I'd been carrying a, a 1911 pistol that has a thumb safety. So to me, it was completely... Uh, automatic to take the thumb safety off. It wasn't a concern, but I, I had fired literally tens of thousands of rounds through guns with thumb safeties before. Most people don't have that experience. Uh, if I were recommending a gun to my wife to carry for personal protection, I probably wouldn't have a thumb safety on it. 
Right. So Glock didn't have a thumb safety, but Glock had these other safety mechanisms. So if you look at the trigger here, the trigger of the SIG and the trigger of the Glock, you can see the Glock has this little tab here. What that tab does is it prevents the trigger from moving backwards from, for example, its own momentum. So if you drop the Glock, the trigger cannot move backwards because that little plastic tab prevents it from doing that. You have to depress that tab with a finger or some other object on the surface of the trigger before the trigger is capable of moving backwards. The SIG doesn't have anything like that. It's just a flat piece of metal. In fact, the uh, this is the aftermarket. This is the recall version of the trigger. The initial trigger on this gun was much thicker and much heavier. And if it's heavier, when it's dropped, it'll have more momentum to sweep backwards and move like a trigger is supposed to move when you want the gun to fire. They did a recall on this on these P320s and they replaced the original fat trigger with this much lighter thin trigger presumably to address that dropped momentum can carry the trigger backwards problem. It, interesting. So I had a my mom had a, a client who was a friend of ours who went out on a hunting trip and he his son actually dropped a couple of rifles and one of them went off struck him in the heart. Um, and he passed away. But I wonder if that if part of the reason why is because the triggers are are usually much thicker on a rifle, at least in my experience, than than a handgun or a pistol. Yeah, so and rifles I often have very, happens. very lightweight triggers, too. So okay. they're very easy to because you're looking for long range accuracy. So you want as light a trigger as possible. Uh, so going rifles. back to your audience, though, what the arguments that we just made are two arguments that you can make. So one is what is what is commonly the safety um, processes that are already in place in the industry? So what are their competitors doing? What does that look like? How what the expenses? And then the second argument, which is expectations. And uh, finally, uh, the third argument actually is utility. So is the design in line with what is expected and what people buy the weapon for um, and in their use? Um, and would the design feature actually um, oppose what it's designed to do? So for me, I, I need the thumb safety. I don't feel, <laughs> I don't feel responsible without it, frankly. And mine also, I have a, I have a Ruger and it has the little trigger uh, depression. Yeah. The plastic. tab trigger is very, very common these days. So, so these are both very common um, additives and, and they're very strong argument. Right now, the plaintiffs have a very strong argument to say, hey, at least some kind of safety measure should have been added when they knew that this was a problem years ago before the incidents that occurred to these plaintiffs in particular. Now, another difference between these pistols that I don't believe the filing talks about is uh, one of the complaints about Glocks for people who like accuracy in pistols, who want a very clean trigger press, uh, the Glocks, these guns, neither of these guns has a hammer. There's no external hammer. There's an internal striker. It's like a metal rod on a spring that goes horizontally through the slide. Um, and it's, it's pre-tensioned. And it when it's released, it moves forward, strikes the bullet, the primer in the bullet discharges the gun. In the Glock, it's only pre-tensioned about halfway. And you, you tension it the rest of the way as part of the trigger pull. And that makes okay. the trigger pull heavier and longer than would otherwise be the case. And many people don't like the trigger pull on a Glock okay. for that reason. The safety benefit is the, the striker is not yet completely tensioned in the gun when you're just carrying it around. It's not fully tensioned until you depress the trigger all the way back. The striker in the, in the SIG is completely tensioned. So it's ready to go and drop and hit the primer if any of the safety mechanisms don't work correctly. Uh, that's much less likely to happen in the Glock because it's never fully tensioned until the trigger is depressed. So that's another difference. You know, SIG made that design. Now, they probably made that design choice because it gave them a better trigger. Right. But the offset of that is the safety uh, issue. Uh, so these are the kind of things they're talking about. Some guns on the back of the grip will have a kind of a, a vertical tab that when you grip the grip, it depresses the tab into the gun and that deactivates another safety mechanism. So the gun won't oh, fire unless there's a hand wrapped around the grip. So if the gun were just dropped in theory, it wouldn't, it wouldn't discharge. Uh, but SIG, SIG didn't add any of any external safety mechanism at all. Not even the little things like the tab on the trigger uh, for example, or something to prevent the, the striker from being fully tensioned, which would be fine if the gun was nevertheless safe. I mean, there's no law that says you have to have those features, 
But if you if you know the features exist, you know they're successfully used, and you don't uh, use them, and then your gun turns out to be dangerous because of the lack of those safety features, yeah, then you have a problem. And uh, hi to Uncivil Law in the chat. Nice to see you. Hey, is it is it Kurt? Hey, Kurt. <laughs> is it is it Kurt? <laughs> Kurt. <laughs> Okay, so let's get back. Where was I? So I talked about the safeties there. Uh, for many years since the weapon was first introduced to the market in 2014, SIG has wantonly failed to recall the 320 despite knowing of scores of grievous wounds inflicted upon users and bystanders. So there was a period of some years, it may have been two or three, uh, to my personal knowledge, where we were hearing these stories about the guns being dropped and ch discharging. Of course, all of us in the gun community know that you know when someone acts negligently and they cause injury, they're going to want to try to blame it on the gun and not on themselves. So we always take these claims with a grain of salt, but it seemed to be a growing number of them. And we were all wondering in the gun community, when is SIG going to recall these guns? Because they kept saying, no, there's no problem. The gun is fine. Yeah, Which, which looked bad because eventually... Eventually, oh, they did a recall. <laughs> <laughs> to everyone in the chat who's giving me a hard time about a Ruger, part of the reason why I chose it is, one, it's cheap. Two, it's American-made. And then three, it has these safety features, which was important to me. I would much rather have a misfire and, you know, end up getting in a little bit of trouble or, you know, having my gun not go off than having it go off at the time that I don't want it to. Because I, I carry my gun with me everywhere. I carry it in my purse. I take it with me everywhere. And so I, I know me as a user personally, I like to have those additional safety features. Plus it makes it more confusing and I don't have kids yet, but once I do, it'd be nice if, if, you know, my kids don't, obviously I'm going to be teaching them gun safety from day one, but in the event that another kid gets a hold of my weapon or they show their friend and the friend pulls on the trigger, I don't want that firing. I want them to have to have the knowledge on how to make the gun fire before it goes off. This this would be terrifying to me as a parent. I mean, I, I couldn't have this gun in my house. Yeah, I mean, it, it you know, they work as intended. You point the gun out, you depress the trigger, the gun fires. And that's exactly what, you know, I, actually the NRA, I think it was the NRA did this. They had, a, because of course the NRA advocates for, for training of children's safety of guns. Um, I believe the program is stop, don't touch, leave the area, tell an adult, something along those lines. Yes. But they did an, a study where they, they would uh, bring kids into a room full of toys. And in one of the toy chests, they buried a you know non-functioning gun. Uh, and the kids would find it. And invariably, they would pick up the gun and point it at another kid and press the trigger. Absolutely. I mean, it's almost instinctive. I don't even understand how instinctive it is. I'll never forget my little brother. He was maybe like two years old and he hadn't watched like war movies or anything or anything that would clue him off to this. And he was going around going boom, boom, boom with his fingers together. And, and it's just it's very intuitive. It's designed to be intuitive. It's an, it's design. It works the way it's designed to work. What scares me is what if it goes off, you know, while I'm walking around? When I, when I put my purse down on the ground, when I go and pick something up, if it falls out unintentionally like that, whew, I can't handle that liability. That's why I don't have a pit bull. And that's why I don't have big dogs because the liability terrifies me. So let's, anyway. let's not get started on pit bulls this show. We'll, we'll do it. We'll end up doing a second oh, hour just in pit bulls. Inter oh, wow. Interesting. So you're probably I'm in not the a same fan. <laughs> uh, yeah, neither am I. And I think that they should be treated with strict liability the same way that you would any other, um, uh, licensed animal, wild animal that you would have in your home. Uh, I think that's the, I think that's the happy medium that needs to happen on a statutory level, but we'll discuss that on another day. And I actually want to run for office. So I'll try and keep my opinions right. yeah. close to my right. chest on that one. Smart play. All right, let me continue. So in additional marketing material under striker safety, again, remember the striker is what it uses instead of a hammer on a firing pin. The striker is basically the firing pin. Uh, SIG further states the striker safety, quote, prevents the striker from being released unless the trigger is pulled. Well, that was demonstrably not the case with those, uh, especially the early generation SIGs, and they're arguing here even the later generation SIGs, the 320s. Uh, at the same time, Six Hour contradictorily stated in the original owner's manual for the 320 on page 25 that the weapon could fire if dropped without the trigger being pulled if a round was chambered inside the firing chamber of the weapon slide. The filing then notes its standard operating procedure for many U.S. law enforcement agencies, local police departments, the military, 
at a commander's discretion, as well as customary for many private owners to carry pistols with a chambered round. Yeah, that's the norm, folks. In fact, the only place I've seen that not be the norm has been uh, with friends of mine who've been in the military. Um, often a commander in a, a military base might tell their um, their men to not have a round in the chamber. And when I've asked about that, they said, well, you know, some guy's a lieutenant colonel. He wants to be a general someday. Uh, he's dealing with a bunch of 18 and 19-year-old kids with rifles. He just wants them to have to take one more affirmative step uh, before that gun can fire. And they're not alone. So yeah. they, they have backup, other soldiers immediately available to back them up. They can afford, they have the luxury of being able to afford that, cycling that bolt to put around in the chamber first. Uh, but for normal self-defense carry, police carry, where you might well be on your own and need that gun to go off in under a second in order to save your life, uh, you don't carry it around with, with no round in the chamber. That's crazy. Absolutely. Uh, Six Hour advertises that users can carry the 320 with a round chambered. By annotating the 320's capacity in various con configurations as 10 plus 1, 12 plus 1, that would mean 10 in the magazine plus 1 in the chamber, for example. Never uh, six hour. in the chamber. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the most important one. Uh, six Hour was aware of the latter fact at the time it designated and manufactured all its pistols, including the 320. The 320 is the first striker-fired pistol it ever manufactured. Uh, uh, it assembled the 320 using the same frame from an earlier hammer-fired pistol, the P250. That's a terrible pistol, by the way, folks. Don't ever buy that. Uh, while competing for a $580 million contract to supply the United States Army with a new service pistol in 2016, which SIG would win, by the way, Six Hours prototype 320s exhibited nearly 200 malfunctions during Army testing, the Army demanded that Six Hour fix all problems associated with the prototype. I do note here that the plaintiffs don't say what the malfunctions were. Uh, there's lots of malfunctions that can happen with a pistol other than them going off when you don't want them to go off. Uh, Which and surprises if, me because if they entered into a into a competitive bidding process with other manufacturers, generally the reports um, on the audits of those weapons or on the audits of the, the unit that is being purchased by the government will be yep. made publicly available because your tax dollars go to paying for that. And if it's not being publicly made available, there may be a problem. Now, with the, the exception to that is anything that would fall under like an ITAR regulation. So anything in the firearms, uh, weapons, military structure. So the reason that I think they don't mention specifically exactly what all the problems are is because they probably already FOIA requested it, which is the Federal uh, Freedom of Information Act, to get those documents and they were turned away for uh, classified or for um, other reasons that the government wouldn't want to let our enemies know why our guns aren't working or that in fact they are not working. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you'd think they would say that, right? If they sought the records and couldn't get them, because wh when I see them not specify them out, because any gun tested by the military is going to have malfunctions. That's just the nature of any mechanical device. They can malfunction. I don't even know if 200 is a lot. I don't know what the scale scale or scope of the testing was. 200, you know, out of 200,000 events, 200 wouldn't seem like very much. Um, Maybe but because were... they don't want to sit there and try and prove a claim that is unrelated to the claim they're making. So mm -hmm. they don't want to make that association with the military too strong. They want right. to focus on civilian use and really focus in on their plaintiffs and their claims. So they're just saying, hey, look, just so you're aware, they did sell to the U.S. military, right? So they outcompeted other people. They did buy it for cheaper. But even in the military, even in the initial stages of, of competition, they said, hey, if you want to keep this contract, you need to fix the problems. So I, I think that they're just mentioning it offhand. I, I hope that they don't make this the focus of the complaint. And I don't think that's their intent. That's why they didn't describe all the issues. Right. Hey, I did just see a super chat question come in and we, we will answer those questions to the best of our ability. Uh, but if you do want a question answered folks, it either has to be made on the law self-defense member dashboard for our law self-defense members, uh, or as a super chat, at least five bucks for the super chat, folks, which, which is crazy. I don't know why you guys do the super chats, because for less than 10 bucks a month, you could be a law self-defense member, get all your questions answered instead of just one. Uh, but it's up to you. If you do want to become a law self-defense member, which I would encourage, lawofselfdefense.com slash join is the way to do that. You can do that right now, right now. Just open up another tab in your browser. All right, let me get back to... The Dick Cheney joke was hilarious. Somebody in the chat was like, <laughs> they said, 
oh, this must have been the gun Dick Cheney had. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the U.S. Army agreed to purchase the 320 uh, only after six hours committed to designing an external manual safety for every military gun sold. That is, we had that slide up. That's this picture, this little tab right here. By the way, it's a very well-designed thumb safety. It was very confidence-inspiring. It has a nice ledge to it, so your thumb can really engage. Uh, the pistol I carry now is also a SIG. It's a different model. It's the SIG 365 XL. There is a thumb safety available for that gun, too, and I don't have it because it's a very poorly designed thumb safety that would be difficult to hit with confidence uh, under stress. But the 320 thumb safety is quite nice. Yeah, men need that because you guys have bigger thumbs. And so it's much harder to hit that ledge. Mine mine on the uh, Ruger is very small. And so it fits me perfectly. It's a, an excellent weapon for me, but for my husband, not so much. He's going to need a little bit more of a ledge there or a lip for his thumb to actually hit if we want to have that type of safety feature for his weapon. So... Let's see. Uh, of the nearly 20 models of non-military P320s, only one model offers a manual external safety as an option. Yes, when I ordered mine, I had to get it as an option from the factory. Um, SIG, custom, SIG Sauer's custom design program allows for hundreds of thousands of different configurations of the 320, but does not allow users to add any type of external safety. Well, Okay, you can get at least one model with a thumb safety. That's what I did. Um, an external manual safety at the time the subject gun was sold was certainly technologically feasible for the 320. Well, we know that because they did it. A properly functioning and active external manual safety uh, would, pro would preclude a properly functioning P320 from firing in an unintended fashion. That's why I got my thumb safety. Uh, upon information and belief, every striker fired pistol in the market is equipped with some type of manual safety whether it is a thumb safety, tab trigger safety, grip safety, decocker, or hinge trigger. And, you know, I haven't done a comprehensive review of every competitor to this pistol on the marketplace, but when I, when I think of the ones I'm aware of, most of them have at least the tab trigger. Some of them have a grip safety. Some of them have other things on them. Uh, I don't believe any of them is as um, free of external manual safeties as is the SIG. And for your audience to know, the reason that the way that the market ar argument works is they're going to end up in court. The judge is going to look at two policy considerations, right? This is what they generally do. They say, OK, if it didn't cost a lot for the manufacturer to install and the rest of the market is doing it, then why didn't you do it? Now, if it turns out that they're providing a, a item or a gun in this case at a cheaper rate than their competitors and they warned you know, fairly warned the user and the user expected this, this problem, um, then it's not necessarily a design flaw. And, and like I said, they're going to try and really heavily argue that this was not a design flaw, that it was a feature of the weapon and that there are consumers who purchased this weapon with that feature in mind. And that is what differentiate, differentiates them from the rest of the market and why they did not include these safety features. And plus, it would have made it cost prohibitive. So their entire audience who would have had access to self-defense and firearms no longer would have that same access. And their market is very different different than, let's say, the Glock or any other um, single action pistol on the market. So these are two competing um, policy ideas that the judge is going to weigh when the time comes. After listening to many, many market experts, we're going to look at the, the economic factors here. They're going to look at each one of the competitors, and they're going to look at the utility. They're going to have experts come in and, and testify as to why they would or wouldn't want these safety features, why it is common or why it shouldn't be as common. So. Because these are, of course, always trade-offs, right? There are advantages right. and disadvantages. I mean, you, you could add like a, a, a rotating combination lock onto the slide of the pistol where it doesn't work unless you press the buttons just right. Uh, but nobody would buy a gun like that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. And, you know, we see this a lot in other manufacturer cases and design cases. So I just wanted to lay out some of those legal arguments for your audience, um, for the non-attorneys out there. Uh, in anticipation of reading the rest of the complaint. So, so let's see. Um, yeah, so upon information and belief, SIG manufactures the only single action pistol on the market not equipped with any form of external manual safety. So that suggests they're an outlier of some kind. 
or at I, least I, upon information and belief. That is one of my right, favorite right, things. You, know. you can say anything upon information and belief. <laughs> that just means we think. Right. We think so. We kind of feel it. We don't know for sure, but we think so. We Which could be wrong. You in there to get your your discovery because right. you're going to when you get to the discovery phase, you're using the complaint sort of as your roadmap and as your boundaries on what is admissible or what is discoverable uh, evidence. And so you're going to want to make it as broad as possible if you're the plaintiff. Right. So that you can really narrow in and say, well, hey, wait a second. We said that you're the only one. So we have the right to go and look into all these other things. Not in this particular uh, clause, but in other clauses, I'm sure they'll mention it again, just so that they can broaden their scope of discovery. Let's see. Uh, sometime after January 2017, when the when a Connecticut law enforcement agent was shot by a P320 that fell to the ground from less than three feet, I believe I remember that case personally, actually. Uh, Six Hour removed the warning from the user manual regarding a chambered round and replaced it with the following language. So they made a change, right? Six Hour made an affirmative change here. Uh, and this is where they add that language about vibration. All Six Hour pistols incorporate the effective mechanical safeties to ensure they only fire when the trigger is pressed. Oops. Uh, however, like any mechanical device, uh, exposure to acute conditions, shock, vibration, heavy or repeated drops may have a negative effect on these safety mechanisms and cause them to fail to work as designed. After suspected exposure to these conditions, have the firearm checked by a certified armorer before using. Mechanical safeties are designed to augment, not replace safe handling pr practices. Careless and improper handling of any firearm can result in unintentional discharge. So this is obviously the board finally had a meeting with legal counsel and they said, <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, you guys, you guys better change the language in the manual because you're leaving yourselves wide open here. Right. And this is decent language. I mean, I really do think that the manufacturer is going to have a, a pretty um, strong argument to say, hey, look, this is operating the exact way it was designed to. We let the users know that this was a design feature and that it was not something that we were taking away from here when they say uh, mechanical safeties are designed to augment and not replace safe handling practices. They're saying if handled safely and with the knowledge that, you know, these acute conditions can cause a gun to go off when not, when you don't expect it to, uh, as long as you're aware of both of those things, you can, in fact, own this weapon and use it as directed um, as it's been designed. So it wasn't a flaw. It was actually a feature. And that's, I'm sure, what they're going to strongly argue in their in their answer. And, and to the person in the comments who criticized the simplistic nature of the, my thumbnail for today's show, it's still better than this SIG graphic. <laughs> and they're a, a multi-million dollar corporation. It's a great uh, graphic. Think, uh, defendant Six Hour had never before represented that mere vibration could cause the weapon to discharge. Yeah, that, that whole vibration thing bothers me because it, you know if you've dropped your gun, maybe it's been damaged, right? Maybe the sights are off. Maybe something happened to the gun. It's unusual to drop a gun. But vibration is with us everywhere and always. And you can't send the gun off to a SIG armorer because you experience vibration that day. You experience vibration every day. Uh, so it seems a very low bar for trying to escape liability for uh, surprise discharges of the gun. Upon information and belief, no other firearms manufacturer has ever made such a representation. They're talking here about the vibration issue. Uh, SIG acknowledges in its own manuals that vibrations can cause its safety mechanisms to fail to work as designed. That's bad, folks. You don't want your safety mechanisms to fail to work as designed. Uh, since the P320's manufacture and distribute distribution into the stream of commerce sig has expressly represented the weapon possessed a robust safety system uh, despite their representation sig sour never made a tabbed trigger safety available as an option for the 320 to my knowledge that's true um, in fact sig sour's original design and manufacture of the 320 rendered the weapon unreasonably dangerous for its intended use and for any foreseeable uses including normal carrying holstering unholstering and or handling I guess they're talking here about the pre-recall design. Um, when Sig Sauer shipped 320s to dealers for sale to civilian customers, Sig Sauer knew or should have known that the weapon was defective in its design and unreasonably dangerous for ordinary uses, intended uses. This 
Oh, sorry. This goes to their negligence claim for everybody who's wondering. Um, they're laying out the negligence claim. They're saying it was, it was, uh, they knew or should have known the weapon was unreasonably dangerous for its intended uses. Um, these are all elements that the court will be looking at when considering these claims and they're laying it out in the complaint so that it doesn't get dismissed so that each one of their complaints get through the 12 B six motion to dismiss, which will be included, uh, in the answer. Right. So the basic concept of negligence, of course, of what we in lawyers would in law school are taught as torts, uh, is that we all have a legal duty not to cause unnecessary, unjustified harm to other people. And if we cause that harm, cause that injury, we bear liability uh, to compensate that person for that injury. It's when you violate that general duty of care that you've engaged in negligent conduct. And your duty is determined by, you know, what it is you're specifically doing, or in this case, what you're making. And so they're laying out the standard of the duty of care for the manufacturer of a firearm. Uh, let's see. Before plaintiffs purchased their pistols, SIG was aware of other prior uncommanded discharges of the 320 platform and other SIG, SIG pistols, many of which predated their purchases. Uh, and then they just go through a whole list of claimed, you know, we don't know how true these are, how accurate these representations are, but there's quite a lot of them. Um, and all these people claim that they did not have their finger on the trigger uh, when the uh, when the gun discharged. Uh, let's see. Uh, so they, they go through a whole list of these. They list these chronologically. The last of them is uh, occurred on August 4th, 2017. And then the next sentence is four days later. Six Hour CEO released a statement stating there have been zero reported drop related 320 incidents in the US commercial market. Ooh, well, that's not true. Ooh, that's not <laughs> bueno. Yeah, that's that the lie detector detected that was a lie. And you know, you guys, it's it's not just um private use and rights of action here that we're worried about. We're not just worried about civilians. You actually, I think it was uh Bronca brought up the idea that once once one police officer fires everybody fires, right? right? So if you have a gun that is accidentally discharging and that's causing all of law enforcement to shoot a guy who honestly shouldn't have been shot in the first place, it's going to cause unnecessary liability for the police and for the victim of the shooting in that case. And so this is this goes beyond just, hey, we're, we're harming people. This has massive implications um, in its use in the industry it's in. And the court will take that into account when deciding whether or not there's liability here. Indeed. Okay, so uh, this statement was false in view of SIG's knowledge that um, these other cases had happened. Um, on August 8th, 2017, so this is uh, just four days later after that statement by the CEO that there were no problems, uh, SIG announced a voluntary upgrade program for the P320 pistol, stating that the pistol meets rigorous testing protocols for global military and law enforcement agencies and all U.S. standard for safety. This statement was also false, as there is no federal government standards for gun safety, a fact known to SIG when it issued this press release. Uh, and that's true. There's no federal list of things a gun should be able to do or tests that should survive. The manufacturer is expected to produce an item for the market that's fit for purpose and not undangerously safe. That's just a general obligation. Um, it's kind of like when they call the owners certified owners, like certified civilian owners. There's not that, that's not a it's thing. Meaningless. Well, it's like saying, you know, it's a natural, natural food. That's that's the label you see on foods all the time. Oh, this is natural. Well, it doesn't mean organic. It doesn't mean anything else. It actually has zero meaning. Just puffery, uh, as the Supreme Court would say. Let's see. No federal agency oversees how firearms are designed or built. Firearms were expressly exempted by Congress from any federal regulation when they created the Consumer Product Safety Commission in 1972. For good reason, by the way, folks, because if you gave the federal government the authority to control this stuff, they would only allow the manufacture of guns that were useless uh, mm -hmm. for their intended purpose, meaning personal protection and, of course, Second Amendment privilege as well. Uh, six hours upgrade program. They call it an upgrade program in scare quotes here. Uh, which was presented to the public as purely optional. That's true. No, no one made me send my gun back. I had that option. Um, uh, not urgent, not mandatory. Offered to mark existing commercial versions of the P320 better by installing a much lighter trigger 
and internal disconnect switch and improved sear to prevent an uncommanded discharge. Uh, you know, folks, especially for people who, who, you know, maybe it's their only gun. Um, you don't really want to box it up and send it off to SIG for a month to have them do whatever it is they're doing with the gun because then you don't have a gun for a month. Um, it, that didn't matter to me. I've got plenty of guns. But, uh, yeah, I, I had to think about whether or not I wanted to send it back. And I have to say, when I got it back, so I was using this pistol, my 320, also for competition purposes. And, when, and one of the things I liked about the 320 was it had a very clean trigger press uh, because of the design aspects of the gun. The trigger was much better than a Glock trigger. Uh, and when I got it back from the recall work, it was much more like a Glock trigger. The trigger was not nearly as nice as it had been before. I probably would not have bought the gun with that trigger uh, in the first place, with the recall trigger. Well, and so that everybody knows too, what they're doing is they're saying they had a duty. They're implying that there was this duty to have urgency, to make a public statement and to recall the weapon as soon as they were aware of these incidents, as soon as they were aware of this unsafe, uh, the unsafe nature of their design. And Sig Which essentially at this time, to, in my opinion. Yeah. So at this time, Sig was not saying, hey, this gun is dangerous until we fix it. They're saying, hey, if you're uncomfortable, you can send the gun back to us and we'll make this modification to it. And this strengthens their argument. What will be Sig's argument that this gun was designed this way per the user's requests, right? So we are hitting, we are targeting a market where they know... <laughs> forgive my language, They're, we're targeting a, a market where we know that the user wants this smooth trigger pull. They don't want all these other safety mechanisms that make it difficult for them to shoot for their intended purposes. In your case, it was competition shooting, but it could be right. you know, any number of cases. So this actually strengthens their argument. And I think it was a, a smart move on their part to do make this a optional recall rather than mandatory. But uh, whether it was a smart move will be decided by the judge. Right. Uh, so that was, uh, they announced that recall on August 8th, 2017. I thought this was a nice touch. On August 9th, 2017, the police chief of Morrow, Georgia, issued an emergency order removing P320s from service. In October of that year, a P320 discharged without a trigger pull in Georgia when an officer fell to the ground. His weapon was holstered and fired simply when he struck the ground. That's bad. Uh, on November, the next month, a P320 discharged without a trigger pull in Dallas. Uh, on February 2nd, another guy was removing a holster containing his P320 from his belt. While in the process of removing the holster and without him touching the trigger, it discharged, striking him and causing catastrophic injuries. This is uh, this example is a little different, right? Because here, the, here the guy's actually handling the gun. He's manipulating the gun. So you have to wonder, was his finger really not on the trigger? Um, but the cases where the uh, the gun is, and there's at least one here where uh, a police officer was on a subway platform. So he's there's cameras that caught this body camera footage and just uh, the kind of surveillance cameras they have on public transport systems. The gun just went off in the holster. Um, oh my gosh! That's that's that and he was clearly not manipulating exactly the gun. What terrifies me. Like even even just taking off a belt and having it go off terrifies me. The idea of just standing there and having it go off, like oh, see this. Hold on, where's that plaintiff with the bedside table? That would be my situation where they're just setting it down on the side table and the gun goes off and it fire, it blows off his hand. I mean, that. Yeah, in fact, here, here's that event here. In August 2018, a Philadelphia transit officer, uh, his 320 fired uncommanded while fully holstered, nearly striking a bystander in the subway concourse. The incident was captured on video and the officer was returned to duty the next day. The transit authority replaced all SIG 320s and later exonerated the officer of any alleged wrongdoing in view of the content of the videotape of the incident showing that it fired without a trigger pull. The officer later stated, quote, this weapon is a hazard. I actually spoke with a lawyer for my situation. Although no one was hurt, someone could have been killed. I'm angry that I was put in a potentially life-altering position with a product deemed safe by its manufacturer. The fact that officers are carrying this weapon on the job and at home around family thinking it's safe even while resting in its holster has me very angry. Everything that I've told you is documented through two investigative services, Philadelphia's Police Firearms Investigative Unit, Officer Involved Shooting Incident Unit, and SEPTA, Transit Police Criminal Investigations Unit. There is station video footage, body-worn camera footage as well. Close quote. Yeah. Well, that's bad. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's pretty really <laughs> That's and and to those who are listening, the reason this is so damning is because he's saying, "Look, I never broke 
any type of, of standard when it comes to safety here. I operated this thing perfectly. And not only did I operate it so well that uh, I wasn't found, you know, guilty of, of or not guilty, but uh, that I that my conduct wasn't found negligent. But we have documented evidence from multiple agencies that focus on safety and the use of these firearms who all cleared me. Meaning that's, I mean, he put that burden for, for the defense to meet right up here. I mean, they're saying either you're going to show that all of these people were wrong and that this is a safe weapon or not. Uh, this is excellent framing, excellent case. Uh, they really did pick that very well. So they, they, on page 18 is when this filing notes that in April, 2018, SIG announced the voluntary upgrade program. Then they can start going through this list of all these uh, uncommanded shootings, firings that happen after the recall started. This is page 18 of the filing. It goes all the way to page 24, folks. And these but are just a sentence or two each. So to it's clarify a very- and correct myself, this was not a recall, right? And they even state that on page 18 at the end of that sentence. This was yeah. not a recall. This what was they a, call voluntary it a voluntary upgrade, recall, right? If they had called it a voluntary recall, I think they would have a stronger leg to stand on. Right. Um, but here they're saying... They didn't recall it. It wasn't called a recall. It was called a voluntary upgrade, which to be fair, the consumer, if it were me, I would think, no, I don't really need that. I like my gun as it is. I've never had a problem. Maybe those other guns have problems and that's why they're offering this voluntary upgrade. But if if I were in your position, Bronca, I wouldn't have sent it in because I think I like my trigger pull as it is. I don't want to have to pay to take it to a gun shop and have them loosen up the, the springs for me again and make it, you know, so that I'm familiar with this gun again. Right. So, yeah, I, that's actually a really strong point I wanted to correct myself on. Yeah, because I'm I'm on a number of gun forums, as you might imagine, and I let people know in those forums when I got my voluntarily upgraded SIG back that the trigger wasn't as good. So just, just be aware, when you get the upgrade, you're going to get a gun back with a, a trigger that's inferior to what it was before you sent it in. All right, so then we go through uh, all the plaintiff's incidents. I'm not going to read all of them. There's 20-some plaintiffs and then their spouses, uh, and they're all highly repetitive. They're basically all making the same claims. But let's step through the first one just so people can see how this kind of thing is structured. Uh, so the first and the named plaintiff, uh, Armanderes, uh, Fernando Armanderes, prior to April 1st, 2020, 20, 2021, the plaintiff had undergone extensive firearms training while serving in the U.S., uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. Uh, he was issued a 320. On April 1st, 2021, he was participating in an annual inventory and removed his 320 to review its serial number. On that date, the pistol suddenly and unexpectedly discharged while he was reholstering it. Uh, he never touched the P320's trigger and did not intend to fire the gun. The bullet struck him in his right thigh, causing substantial injury, maceration of tissues, Blood loss, nerve damage, along with severe emotional trauma. With the full extent of the physical damage to his leg is not yet known. He has had and is likely that he will have trouble running, sitting, standing, as he had before the incident, will likely never be able to return to his pre-incident form as a result of diminished physical capacity. As a direct and proximate result of defendant's negligence, carelessness, recklessness, strict liability, and or other liability pr producing conduct, uh, the plaintiff was forced to suffer serious disabling and permanent injuries and emotional distress, the full extent of which had yet to be termed. So all this stuff here, this negligence, carelessness, strict liability, other liability here, the plaintiffs are just trying to make sure they've captured every legal theory under which they could, uh, they could be found le legally liable. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm not entirely sure how it works in criminal law, but you can amend your complaint um, to add things or to to remove things or add things later. But it's much it is challenging. And so it's better to put in as much as you can and then have things removed as you as you move forward. Um, in civil law, you are allowed to present two conflicting uh, claims. So let's say here you're saying, uh, you know, it's a strict liability case. Well, we have a claim for strict liability. It should fall under strict liability, but also negligence. Right. So they're they're throwing in everything they possibly can, which you're allowed to do in civil law, which makes sense, because as discovery develops, you may have a different claim than what you started off with. Yeah. And uh, of course, as we as we know from some of the criminal cases I've covered, some of these high profile cases like the like the Alec Baldwin case, for example, uh, negligence is when they're arguing that, hey, maybe maybe you didn't 
actively know, affirmatively know you were creating a risk, but you should have known you were creating the risk. Recklessness is when you knew you were creating an unjustified risk and you did it anyway. And recklessness gives rise to potential criminal liability, not just civil liability. Um, so something Which maybe to, putting, to scare the they're CEO They're them up right now. Yeah, yeah, I would be scared as CEO. I'd be scared because they're saying you knew. And as a matter of fact, here's all the evidence that you knew. You went, you changed the language, right? You, you issued this uh, voluntary upgrade, right? Safety upgrade rather than issuing a recall. And you knew that this was happening like from out of the gate, right? From the very beginning. And not only that, but you actually saw a government contract and the army informed you that there were these issues with the weapon way back when you were awarded the contract. So they're they're developing this criminal liability uh, case, which is the strongest, um, the strongest uh, level of liability in this case. And that's why they're doing it is because if they can meet that, that very high burden, then the court might end up settling on just simple uh, negligence or, or you know, some level of recklessness. Or, of course, it may, it may induce a settlement, right? Who's going to decide right. on what a settlement would be? That would be the CEO. The CEO, if, all, if his only exposure is money, that's one thing. If his exposure is going to prison, uh, well, he'd rather spend other people's money to make that you know, criminal liability go away. And it's going to be a very high settlement because um, this also this also puts evidence um, that would go towards um, not punitive damages, but something akin to punitive damages, these enhanced damages and recovery that they talked about in the very beginning. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, the plaintiff has in the past and is reasonably likely to require medicines, medical care, treatment, this will all go. These are all factors that will go into the amount of whatever compensation or settlement is uh, uh, ultimately arrived at. Um, it's not. It's not like it's. We know right now what the fixed cost of these damages is. It's not a car that got wrecked and there's a dollar value for the car. You just pay the guy that money and you're good. Uh, these are going to be ongoing, lifelong um, expenses that these plaintiffs uh, will incur, as well as things like pain and suffering, emotional anguish. Uh, we'll see later the loss of consortium claim. Uh, the plaintiff has in the past, may in the future, continued to be disabled from performing his usual duties, occupations, and avocations. That just means hobbies. Uh, all to his great loss and detriment. The incident has resulted in substantial physical harm and related trauma to the plaintiff who has received substantial and ongoing treatments and medicines. So this is page 24. This These kinds of claims will continue for all the other plaintiffs for another like 25 pages all the Has way up he to lost page... his job. Uh, I mean, all of his injuries and claimed loss yeah. would, in, would imply that he's lost his job. But um, for those who are wondering the, the other reason you include all of this is to say he's no longer able to work. So here's what he could have potentially been making. Here's what he could potentially could have been earning. It's not just the loss of a leg or the loss of the ability to, um, have an intimate relationship with his wife, but he now also cannot make this much money. So you need to, you know, in the settlement, the discussion will be, okay, if he could have made X number of dollars in his lifetime, but for this incident occurring, you know, that's what you need to pay out. Plus, in addition to that, you know, his pain and suffering and ongoing treatments and everything else. I mean, as the plaintiff, you're throwing on as much as you possibly can. This guy is right. disabled. He's a vegetable. There's nothing he can do. His wife is crying. His kids are traumatized. The kids need, you know, the kids need treatment. You throw in the kitchen sink and then that way you have more leverage to negotiate that settlement. Yeah. And ideally, this would end up with some kind of net present value payment for all those future expenses that you anticipate happening. Um, so the person gets the money up front. Also, so the lawyers get their their piece of it up front. Uh, because yep. this is almost certainly will be a contingency case, right? You want to talk about that, Danny? Because this is di different than in criminal law, of course. Yeah. So uh, in in civil litigation, you can take what's called a contingent. You can take a case on contingency, meaning if I win, I get a payout. And the rules for the contingency, like the uh, the percentage that you can be paid out, is is very uh, flexible. Uh, if you enter into a contingency with an attorney, it must be in writing. Uh, so make sure that uh, any attorney that you're working with gets that in writing. I'm sure every attorney you work with will do that. But uh, yeah, so basically they're going to, they only get a payout if they win. And sometimes contingencies, they can say, hey, look, we're going to settle this case and they can push their client into settlement far more than you could if you were just on retainer. Uh, at, at, 
I'll have to check the rules exactly whether or not they can force. I don't think they can force a settlement on a contingency basis, but there is a very well, you, high. You, you can and you can't, right? I mean, ultimately it's right. the client's decision, but the client's making right. the decision based on what you communicate to the client, right? Right. And at that point you've put in so much work, right? There's this sunk cost where if you decide, oh, I'm not going to represent you anymore because you're not going to take the settlement. You just lost all of those months of hours and dedication and time and resources that your firm had to pay out for. So that's why I, again, assume that this is a large law firm because you generally have to have a large war chest to take these types of cases on a contingency basis because you are paying up front the cost of everyone's time and labor until you win the case. But the, um, the, the incentive for settlement is very high in these cases generally, because you're only going to get paid out if you win. If you end up losing in court or you get, a, uh, you get uh, uh, damages that aren't to your liking and you know that you could have uh, argued for more in a settlement, then you're going to push for that settlement. So uh, that's, that's a contingency. And uh, they're great if you can get them and if you have an attorney who's competent and it, contingency basis is, are also great ways for new attorneys. Um, if you are a new attorney who's trying to get into a new area of law, it's excellent because although you're not getting paid up front, you're gaining a ton of experience and knowledge uh, that you'll take with you into that area of law as you continue to practice and build your practice. Yeah, I know a number of lawyers, they do uh, personal injury work largely on contingency and they do very, very, very well for themselves. Yeah, you make bank that way. So if you are going into personal injury or you're looking at uh, working for a firm that does that, do expect to have a lot of these contingency type cases and uh, expect not to receive a, a constant stream of income until the case is settled or or uh, resolved. Yeah, and so I, I've never really done much civil work, but I have friends who do it. And parts of it strike me a lot like the, like the criminal... Uh, uh, plea bargaining arrangement where so many of the criminal cases, they, they never get to trial. The vast majority never go to trial because they're pled out beforehand, really in terms of efficiency uh, of the system. You, you, the system couldn't possibly bring everybody to criminal trial. Um, and I know friends of mine who are lawyers who do a lot of insurance work, personal injury work with insurance companies, uh, you know, a lot of their stuff gets settled very quickly. It's very kind of a very formalized process. Everybody knows what everything's worth. There's not a lot of arguing that goes on. And so those lawyers, they get their cuts from those settlements quick. Uh, right. But when you start suing for lots of money, uh, then nor naturally you get pushback from the insurance company and then it becomes a much more drawn out process. Well, and you, you also want to be very particular about who your clients are when you take a case on contingency, right? You need a client that you can work with. You need a client who's very patient, who doesn't need the money up front, doesn't need the money right now, or who does and who is willing to settle, um, but who doesn't have a, a number in mind when it comes to settlement. So generally, when I'm interviewing these clients, I'll say, you know, well, what is your goal? What is it that you would like to see as recovery? What are some expectations we can set? prior to going into this arrangement of you hiring me to represent you, because the last thing I want is someone to jump in and be like, I want a million dollars. And it's like, yeah, yeah, cut your finger on a piece of glass. And, you know, it's, it's just not going to work out. So and there's a lot of those to, clients out there. Yeah, absolutely. And so you have to practice a lot of due diligence as a civil litigator to go through, look at their um, past, you know, history. So just be aware if you are looking for one of these attorneys, one of the things you should expect is that that attorney will ask you what your motivations are, um, how many cases you've brought to in personal injury before, how many attorneys you've gone through, um, and then whether or not you're willing to share the pot, which in this case, it sounds like everyone is on board. Everybody signed the same agreement. Everybody knows that if the conflict arises, that person is no longer going to be in the group with everyone else. So there's there's a lot of gamesmanship that goes into this that uh, you don't see quite as much on the on the uh, uh, criminal side. It's it's all here. It's all money and sense and strategy and time and effort and business. I mean, ultimately, attorneys, we make our money this way. And so we, we do have to make um, sound business decisions in the interest of our continuing profession. So don't be offended if your attorney is is, you know, turns down your case. It's not that you may not have a good claim. Maybe that you're not the best client, the best fit for that attorney and vice versa. Maybe you you don't have a claim and you may be a perfectly fine person, but uh, you're just not as knowledgeable on the law. So uh, always seek a second opinion. But generally, 
uh, talk to your attorneys, get to know them before you hire them. Sorry, you asked me about contingency and I just went yeah, on a huge course. tangent. But Absolutely. I think it's that's, all related. That's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks, I see a lot of great questions in the chat. But again, if you want the questions answered, you either have to ask them as a law self-defense member on our dashboard or as a super chat, five buck minimum super chat. So otherwise, I there's just too many. I super chat in there, a couple yeah. actually. We'll, okay. we'll 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 go through those when we get to the uh, when we get to the end. Um, all right. So what we heard, uh, what we were just reading through, was kind of the damages that the first plaintiff had suffered, and then all the other plaintiffs have similar two or three page descriptions of the event and the damages they suffered. Then we get to what are called the counts, and the counts are really the legal rationale for uh, the legal doctrine under which SIG should be held liable. There's uh, at least two of these for each of the plaintiffs. One is negligence. As we talked about negligence and saying, hey, you should have known that you were creating this unjustified risk uh, and you didn't do anything about it when you should have known and I suffered damages, therefore you're liable for the damages under the principle of negligence. And with the first named plaintiff, um, a little boiler technical legalese here, plaintiff readopts, realleges all paragraphs of this pleading as a fully set forth herein. At all relevant times, Six Hour owed the plaintiff the duty to design the 320 weapon in such a manner and with the exercise of reasonable care so as to prevent it from firing without a user trigger pull before selling the gun and placing it into the stream of commerce. At all relevant times, SIG owed the plaintiff the duty to manufacture, assemble, inspect, and or test its 320s in such a manner and with the exercise of reasonable care so as to prevent it from being fired without a trigger pull before selling the gun placing it into the stream of commerce at all relevant times, say go to duty to unambiguously warn consumers and or intended users. Wow. That's a broad category intended users of the 320, including plaintiff of known or suspected defects that rendered the gun unreasonably dangerous to handle or use upon information and belief. Again, that just means we think uh, six hour knew or had reason to know the 320 posed an unreasonable risk of harm by virtue of informal and formal claims arising from substantially similar incidents, internal testing and research. That's all going to be discovery. That's what they're, they're, they're laying the groundwork for here. Industry publications and research and other sources of information to be developed in discovery. The other sources are going to be things like YouTube. Yep. Uh, Sig Sauer breached the above cited duties in various ways, including but not limited to one or more of the following negligent acts. One, by failing to use due care in designing and manufacturing the 320s firing and striker assembly to prevent uncommanded discharges. Two, by failing to use due care in designing the 320, uh, failing to incorporate a manual external safety, tabbed trigger safety, or grip safety. Three, by failing to use due care in designing and manufacturing the 320s internal components, including its sear. The sear is what releases the striker to move forward, folks. It's what's moved by the trigger when you press the trigger. Uh, and by emitting a mechanical disconnect switch to prevent uncommanded discharges. That mechanical disconnect is, uh, is uh, a little thing that blocks the sear from falling, uh, from moving forward and, and uh, igniting the cartridge unless the trigger has been mechanically moved all the way to the rear of its movement. Um, Glocks have that. SIGs did not, apparently. Um, by failing to issue a mandatory recall as opposed to the voluntary upgrade of the 320, as SIG has done in the past with other defective products. Five, by failing to make reasonable tests and inspections to discover the defective hazardous and unreasonably dangerous conditions uh, relating to the gun's propensity to discharge uncommanded. Six, by negligently failing to unambiguously warn purchasers and end users of the gun, including plaintiff of said defective hazardous and unreasonably dangerous conditions. Seven, by failing to discover the defective, hazardous, and unreasonably dangerous conditions. Eight, by negligently failing. Well, I'm not going to read through all of these, I guess, but any one of these would be enough to establish negligence. So they're just listing everyone they can possibly imagine uh, they might be able to prove. Prove, by the way, by a preponderance of the evidence here, not beyond a reasonable doubt, like in a, a criminal trial, but it's, it's a matter of 51% of the evidence. Uh, if the jury thinks, well, we think it's more likely... Yeah, yep. it's 50% pr plus a feather. So it's not even 51%. It could be 51.001%, right? And what they're doing here too is they're setting up different standards of duty based on different claims. So here they've set up the uh, design standards of duty um, for a design uh, flaw. They're also setting this up for a manufacturing flaw. They're saying, look, maybe it was a process in the manufacturing. Maybe it was this, maybe it was that. Regardless, here uh, were your the marketing. Misrepresentation right. of the qualities of the pistol. 
Right. Uh, you knew. And if you didn't know, you should have known, right? You should have gone through and done testing. You should have actually had something to back up that claim. Um, so they're, they're making this as broad as possible to include all of these claims to get all of their discovery in and to recover as much as humanly possible, which is exactly what I would be doing. We're in it for the okay. money. Uh, let's see. We can't get your arm back, but maybe we can help out with uh, right. your finances. So. Uh, SIG knew or should have known that exposing users to the dangerous and defective and hazardous conditions existing in the gun would or could give rise to serious bodily injury, up to and including death. The gun's defective condition was not visible, so the user could not have known. And the plaintiff was not capable of realizing the dangerous condition and could not have discovered the dangerous condition, even upon performing a reasonable inspection of the same. Um, yeah, because they don't they want to try to close the door in an argument that, hey, the the user of the gun should have it was, should have been obvious to them that something was wrong with this pistol. And therefore, they right. share in liability for the injury. Exactly. They're saying that this is a this is a hidden kind of danger that no one would have ever anticipated. Right. This isn't something that you could have ever known. Um, it's also removing some to some extent, some liability for um, the purchasers like the army, like police uh, and and other owners where the end user was was not the actual purchaser so they're they're expanding the scope of their potential um uh parties to represent the potential right. plaintiffs uh, let's see sig sours negligence as alleged in this count directly and approximately uh some weird grammar here oh um anyway caused the plaintiffs uh, unintended discharge and injuries resulting from the accident as a direct and proximate result of the negligence set forth in this count, the plaintiff suffered severe physical injury, mental anguish, inconvenience, loss of the capacity for the enjoyment of life, physical deformity and handicap and embarrassment associated with the same, loss of earnings and earning capacity, incurred medical attendant care, life care expenses for his care and treatment. These injuries are either permanent or continuing in their nature, and the plaintiff will suffer such losses and impairments in the future. Wherefore, plaintiff demands judgment in their favor and against the Sig Sauer for so weird, weird. Someone should have cleaned up the writing here um, for compensatory and enhanced compensatory damages uh, together with lawful interest attorney's fees. So they want attorney's fees. That might be another reason they're in federal court and all other claims available by law. So th that was the negligence argument for why SIG should be held liable. But there's another legal theory under which they could be held liable. And that's one that's um, particular to uh, civil cases here. And that is strict product liability. So can you explain to us how that works, Danny? Yeah. So um, for, well, they explain it here really well, actually. It's basically saying that they're strictly liable because it's engaged in regular business of designing, assembling, manufacturing, selling, some, putting into the stream of commerce something that is inherently dangerous. Okay. There's there, the, by virtue of this item existing, they should be held strictly liable, meaning it doesn't matter what your intent was. It doesn't matter whether or not they knew or should have known. The fact is, is because you were making this um, unreasonably unsafe item that, that exists in the world that we do need, but is unsafe by nature of it existing, in which case uh, firearms, think firearms, think um uh, bombs, explosives, chemicals, hazardous materials, because this is a hazardous uh, material or item, it doesn't matter what the heck you were thinking or knew or should have known. What does matter is, did you put into place what is required of you to um, avoid some level of liability? Because doesn't matter, you are strictly liable. The court will find you liable regardless of what your knowledge or intent was or should have been. Um, and that's a reflection of the, the inherent dangerousness of whatever the item involved. Here, a gun, as you say, explosives, chemicals, drugs. Uh, we all know that uh, they can be used safely. They serve important purposes. But if they're used unsafely in even the slightest way, they become an immediate jeopardy to, to innocent life. Right. And so, I mean, they lay it out really, really cleanly here. So they placed it into the stream of commerce. Um, each each one of these elements go to the strict liability um, tort claim that they're that they're bringing here. So it was in there. It was designed, assembled, yada, yada, for the reasons set forth above. I mean, really clean language. I actually will probably pull. I'm glad that you sent this to me because I'm going to use some of this as my uh, boilerplate language in my future in my uh, future complaints. 
And then they have a third basis of liability for SIG here, and that's violation of New Hampshire's Consumer Protection Act. Most states, probably every state, has some kind of Consumer Protection Act. Uh, and they're, they're here they're actually pulling state law into federal court to apply this. Um, and uh, basically just says, you know, SIG is engaged in unfair and deceptive acts. This will be a lot of the marketing stuff, right? They marketed the gun as safe. They, they explicitly said in marketing materials, it will not go off unless the trigger is pulled. If the plaintiffs can demonstrate to the satisfaction of a jury that that's not the case, uh, then they lied in their marketing materials, especially if they knew it, uh, which is what the claim is. Uh, SIG's actions have been willing and knowing, and the direct and proximate cause of substantial damage is the plaintiff, entitled plaintiff to mandatory doubling Oh, here's what they're going for: discretionary oh, troubling of getting. damages. Okay, see, right. so this is this is beneficial. I mean, if I knew that this this type of statute was in place in New Hampshire, I would have highly recommended that Six Hour move its uh, headquarters because if if you have this type of cause of action, you don't want that to be applied to any type of case when you are a uh, arms manufacturer. But I, I so, doubt that uh, any state has anything less than this, uh, to be fair. So how does this work in execution? Is this the, a jury would decide damages, presumably, say they decided 100 million. I'll just make a number up. Uh, does the jury then also have to agree to the doubling or trebling? Or, or is that a ruling of law that would be made, made by the judge? It says mandatory. So it's statutorily doubled. Um, it's right. just what happens. So whatever his... Uh, his discretionary troubling of actual damages as well as reasonable legal fees. So they are basing this though on the substantial damages. So his his substantial damages, they're going to try and and I'm guessing the statute operates with compensatory damages, um, trouble, everything else. So everything comes under that and then you double it. That's the way I'm reading this, but I could be misreading and I don't know that statute specifically, but yeah, it is it would mandatory. Make it would make sense if it was a function of law as opposed to the jury, right? So the jury just decides right. what kind of the base compensation ought to be. And then as a matter of law, because of these unsafe practices, if they're proven to the satisfaction of the judge, perhaps, uh, that these these doubling and trebling provisions are, are triggered as a matter of law. Right. It just happens. There's nothing. No one has to do anything about it. So if A, then B. So here we're on page 51. We just went through the first counts for the first plaintiff, but there's some 20 odd plaintiffs here. So this all continues for about 100 pages, folks. So I'm going to skip past all that. It's all largely repetitive for each one of the uh, the people involved. Um, Copy and paste. It was a lifesaver for all attorneys. <laughs> yeah. I'll, and I'll, I'll put a link. I, I forgot to do this before the show, but I'll put a link to this document in the notes for the show. So if you, uh, if you want to download it yourself, uh, you'll be able to do that conveniently. Um, I mean, it is, of course, on the internet, like everything. That's where I got it, but uh, to make it easier for everyone to access. All right, then just in passing, we really already spoke to this, uh, but on page uh, 136, uh, we get to the loss of consortium claims. These will all be spouses of the, the people who are injured. Uh, they've lost, they're deprived of love, assistance, companionship, consortium, consortium being the sexual act and society of her husband, all to her great loss and detriment. So it's not just the person injured, it's her spouse that has this independent uh, cause and, of action against SIG. Right, and that's why I clarified that it's not just boinking, right? Loss of consortium, con, cons, blah, 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 consortium goes to you know a loss of love, a loss of assistance, a loss of companionship. So if you have someone who, let's say they can, they can boink, but they're super depressed as a result, or they're on some type of pain medication that alters their, their personality, the way that they interact with their loved one. Um, and that may lead to a divorce. Those are all claims that can be, those are all incorporated into that loss of consortium. Consortium. Why am I struggling so badly on this word today? Claim. Yeah. So, and uh, then we get to, we go through all the loss of consortium claims and then we get to the last page here more or less the last page, where they list the lawyers, the lawyer signature. So it looks like they've got some local council here at the bottom in Concord, New Hampshire. And then I expect that the, the firm actually driving this litigation is this firm here uh, that's out of Pennsylvania. And they have yep. uh, ProHack vice applications in ProHack, meaning that's how an out-of-state lawyer is permitted to act in a, in a court in a different state where they're not normally barred. It's pr pretty pro forma. It's not really complicated, but uh, normally your license is good only within whatever state you're barred. 
Uh, so you have to do this pro hack process if you're from out of state and they're all out of state. They're all Pennsylvania. And uh, so depending I, on your jurisdiction, they may have additional uh, requirements in order to admit someone pro hoc. So if if you are in California, my understanding is, is that you or not California, Arizona, you or Idaho, excuse me, Idaho, you have to actually have a law office, a physical office in the state. Um, you have to be like practicing in the state. I think you have to have had at least one case under your belt in order to utilize your office for pro hoc VG um, uh, applications and admittance to practice in that jurisdiction. So just a heads up. It's not like you can just Go meet a. I can't call Andrew and be like, "Hey, Andrew, I would like to try a case in Colorado under this pro hoc admittance. Uh, can you let me in?" He may have specific rules in his jurisdiction that would prohibit me from doing that. So, so here's that uh, local council first. Here's that Pennsylvania law firm, the king of construction accidents. So it looks like it's all big dollar amount injury stuff. Uh, I think they have a list here. Um, Verdicts and settlements, 1.2, that looks like billion, 265 million, 227 million, 100 million, 160 million. So this is this will be well-funded litigation. Oh, wait, 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 go up, go up. That that billion dollar, that's the um, that's the building that collapsed in Surfside. That condo that collapsed, my like absolute nightmare terror situation where you're asleep in bed or you're just hanging out and suddenly the lights go off and your entire body is is oh. I can't even imagine. So I didn't even know that they were involved in that litigation. So these these guys do have a, a very strong track record on this stuff. Yeah, these are all tens of millions of dollar settlements, folks. Wait, was that Zimmerman? Money. Hold on, was that the Zimmerman case? This must have been a civil claim on the Zimmerman lawsuit. I don't think he oh, ever no, got no, any no, money. No, 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 no. Okay, that's the name of the attorneys. Okay, my apologies. Yeah. I just saw Zimmerman and got a little excited. So. Yeah, no, I don't think George Zimmerman ever got any money. Um, you know, it's a fun, it's a funny story about that. It's off the topic, but, uh, so, uh, Zimmerman went to, uh, of course, criminal trial where he was acquitted in front of, uh, the criminal trial judge in Florida. Uh, but the, 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 the those judges in Florida, they switch in back and forth between criminal and civil. Uh, and when, when Zimmerman brought his civil suit, guess which judge got his civil suit? The same judge who'd been his criminal trial judge. Oh no. And then a few months later, someone tried to shoot Zimmerman in the head as he was on his way to a doctor's appointment. That shooter got caught and charged with attempted murder. And guess who got and now now Zimmerman was the victim in that shooting case, right? Testifying oh, no, in court as a victim. Guess judge? which judge got that criminal trial? <laughs> the the I, same how, judge. That's that's bizarre. You would think that there's some kind of rule to prevent judges from having that type of situation because judges are supposed to be impartial on each case, not right. you know. So that that's that's too bad for him. And it's interesting when when because Zimmerman tried to sue with various uh, various news agencies for doctoring photos and and uh, doctoring nine one one recordings to make him look particularly bad. Uh, and uh, the judge who had been Deborah uh, God Deborah Deborah Nelson I believe was her name Judge Deborah Nelson. Uh, she uh, she I watched every minute of that criminal trial. And in my mind, she was very favorable to the state and very unfavorable to the defense. I don't remember. 99% of her rulings were against the defense. And every time the defense appealed those rulings directly to the appellate courts, the defense was sustained uh, and the judge was overturned. So it's not like she was making solid decisions against the defense. Um, and then when it came up for the civil trial uh, with Zimmerman suing these news agencies and she caught that civil trial, uh, frankly, she should have recused herself, I think because of the bias she showed in the criminal trial. Uh, but then she said, no, I'm dismissing the civil suit because you're a public figure because Zimmerman appeared on TV to defend himself after the shooting before the trial. Uh, and she said, no, you spoke, you spoke to the media on TV talking about the, uh, the criminal trial. Therefore you're a public figure just dismissed all the civil suits completely out of hand. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I would have appealed that. I mean, I would have done something because he would have been a, he would have been what we consider a, um, a public figure for a limited purpose. And I think that that was, if, if she dismissed it truly on the public figure doctrine, I mean, that, that is inappropriate, a bad call on her part. Um, and I will be discussing on my channel later on this week, um, the differences between a public figure, public figure for uh, limited purposes and a public official. Uh, all of those have different standards and rules um, when it comes to what they can do in terms of blocking people from their websites and from their social media. 
Uh, and we will be discussing that because when I was running, a very salty attorney was upset that I had blocked him from my, my uh, campaign page where he was harassing me and sent me a very long demand letter uh, saying, <laughs> you need to unblock me because I have a legal right to be there. And he was uh, very, very wrong. So we will be dissecting that demand letter uh, live uh, next week. Oh, nice. That'll be fun. That'll be a good show. Remember, folks, Danny's uh, YouTube channel information and her Twitter information are in the comments. I don't know if you just want to say them aloud during the show. Yeah, or is so it just uh, Danny on direct. My Twitter is different. Uh, Twitter handle is uh, elect DA for DA because I was running for the DA's office at the time. Uh, so go check me out. I have a lot of fun. I like to discuss law and politics. The two go hand in glove, and that's sort of my expertise. And uh, yeah, I would love to see you guys over there. We try and have a good time. I like to be a little more laid back. And I tried to uh, add some commentary that was um, useful for your audience that I may or may not add in my own video because I don't want to be corrected by other attorneys who are watching because I said the wrong thing or I used a term of art incorrectly. And I just, I can't handle that nonsense. Um, it, it, it's triggering. So I try and keep it as laid back as possible and explain things in a way that makes sense to the lay person, which I wish someone would have done for me through law school. But they assume since I got through the LSAT and uh, scored top of my class in undergrad that I would understand what they were saying, which is not always the case. So I try and, and break it down and make it simple. For both Danny and me, when you get to our YouTube channels, folks, if you watched anything, uh, two or more of our shows and you're not subscribed, we have beef, all right? Subscribing is free. <laughs> Hitting that like button, folks, is free. It's absolutely free. Don't not do that. Like is the single most important factor uh, YouTube takes into consideration in spreading the content. So absolutely hit that. What do we got? Most of you, but uh, about 40% of you watching this right now have not hit the like button. Folks, hit that like, thumbs up, uh, and be sure to subscribe. And particularly with Danny's, uh, her channel's new. She's just growing it, just broke through 1,000 subscribers. Uh, she's got to build up some viewer hours before she can monetize. So let's get her over that threshold so she can make full use of the YouTube platform. Uh, yeah, all right, folks, and then I promise to quit my day job and come and be with you guys all the time. That's the goal. So if yeah. I can just have a full-time YouTube channel, baby, I would absolutely love to do that. I also will be including my life vlogs uh, as a part of it because I, I – Prior to running for office, when I was bored, um, I got a GoPro and I was like, oh, I travel the entire Western United States and show people things they wouldn't otherwise see. So I'm going to be including that old channel into my new channel. So there's a little bit of something for everyone on my on my page. Sorry. No, no, all good. All good. <laughs> so I'm going to go through the questions here. Uh, folks, we're here today as lawyers. We're, we're not uh, gun experts, gun engineers. I know some of you are like certified armorers for SIG pistols. I'm not. I don't think Danny is. So to the extent your questions are, are about engineering specifics of safety mechanisms in, in this pistol or other pistols, I'm just going to skip over that. We're, we're here to answer legal questions. So uh, and I, I, I more than concede that there are some of you in the chat and the comments who have greater expertise with the SIG 320 uh, than I do. No worries. No offense taken. Uh, let's see. Lots of people talking about what guns they carry. Uh yeah, someone says, oh, the people believed they did not pull the trigger. Oh, right. Like I said, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, some of these cases are saying the gun was completely in the holster, so there was no trigger access. Others say, well, it went off while I was reholstering. Well, I've seen guns go off reholstering. Things get caught in the trigger guard. People get sloppy with their trigger finger, and, you know, you press it into the holster. Your finger goes backwards. It depresses the trigger. The gun goes off. And maybe you honestly don't know you had your trigger in the finger because the whole thing is so, so shocking. Uh, but it's it's ambiguous, and you know the plaintiffs have the burden of proof on those issues. Uh, certainly, if that if it's true that that, that transit officer in, in uh, Philadelphia, there's video footage of his gun just sitting in the holster, untouched, going off, that would be bad. Uh, let's see. Uh, ownership ownership shouldn't be a condition precedent to a claim, though, if someone was hurt by someone else's weapon. Uh, well, for some of the claims, uh, you'd want for example, with the misrepresentation claim, you'd want plaintiffs who had been misrepresented, right? They'd seen right. marketing materials, things along those lines. Maybe more, you know, maybe they got the manual with the gun when the gun arrived and there was no kind of cautions in it. Someone who bought the gun secondhand may not have that stuff. Right. But they did, they did throw, like I said, the whole kitchen sink at there. So proximate and actual and direct cause, 
they they really did, you know, sort of cover all their bases to include uh, potential litigants who may or may not have a claim. But one of the things you don't want to risk is um, getting before a judge at a motion to dismiss hearing and having to lose some of your plaintiffs um, by the court standing. So you want to you want to set this up for as much success as you possibly can. And the last thing you need is defense coming in and poking holes in your potential plaintiffs uh, for recovery. Okay, those are all the member questions. Let me take a look at the super chats and see what we have. Um, Storm Crow, ten dollars super chat. Whoops, that's the wrong button. There, yeah, that's the right button. Um, oh, Lottie, is there any way this lawsuit can bring up the M eighteen competition and how Sig Army did not follow the rules for adoption? The salt would be great. So the M eighteen competition he's referring to that was the Army competition for adoption of a new pistol to replace the Beretta ninety two. Uh, whatever pistol was going to be adopted would be called the M18. The SIG 320 won that competition. So in military use, it's called the M18. But other pistols were competing. Glock was competing. So if Glock had won, the military version of the Glock would be called the M18. But uh, there's always questions about, you know, whether shenanigans are being played in these testing regimens, uh, whether I don't want to suggest bribes can be paid, but sometimes things like that happen. SIG is an American-based company, at least for production of that pistol. Glock is, I think all the Glock pistols are still made uh, in Austria. Oh. Um, yeah, Glock's yeah, that's a foreign a company. Consideration so. in, when, when they're competing for a contract, I'm assuming that's what we're talking about here. Sorry, my, blank, my brain kind of blanked out. But if they're competing for a contract, um, accessibility and ease of accessibility, so having certain parts like... We can't in firearms, I don't know if it's the case for firearms, but when I did um, trade compliance for Raytheon with the, some of our larger weapons uh, manufacturers, if there was one part that came from an enemy state or a state that was questionable in terms of their relationship to the US, we wouldn't work with them. So if, if, if there are parts that become unavailable due to war, or due to um, circumstances that the government can foresee, reasonably foresee, in the case of firearms, war is the primary one. Um, then you don't want you don't want anything that's coming from an international place, and it's going to be if there's an argument that they were treated unfairly because of uh, fake testing or whatever, that's going to be a claim from the uh, competitors. And it's going to be very difficult to prove because if the army knew of these things and they took that into account, which they say that they did, um, then you kind of lose your claim as a competitor since they knew of this and they decided to go with the competition anyway. So Right. And of course, another issue. So a, a lot of the foreign gun manufacturers, when they want to, well, first of all, there's, there's, there's restrictions on importing firearms that apply to guns made out of the country that you want to import that don't apply. Things like uh, barrel length and stuff like that. So you, if the gun's made in the U.S., you have greater discretion in how to design and uh, the gun. Um, also, of course, uh, if you're trying for a government contract and you have manufacturing facilities in the U.S. and you'll be expanding manufacturing within some congressman's district, uh, you know, then you have a champion for what you're doing. So SIG is a Swiss, uh, a German Swiss company, but they built a New Hampshire facility so they could manufacture in the U.S. Uh, Beretta is an Italian company, but when they wanted to win the the army, the military, U.S. military um, competition for pistols back in, I guess, the 80s, uh, they established a manufacturing facility in Maryland, I believe, to do that. Um, and uh um, I, I see in the comments someone mentioning that some, at least some Glocks now are made in Georgia. Glock did a very similar thing. They they have a giant manufacturing facility in Smyrna, Georgia. Um, but uh, I, when I bought my Glocks, they were all made in Austria, and it was more kind of a um, a boxing maintenance parts type of operation in Georgia. But maybe Glocks making guns in Georgia too now. I don't I don't really know. Uh, let's see. Um, Five dollars talking about the vibration question. Could vibration cause these problems? Thank you very much for the five bucks. He writes uh, rain four thirty two. Writes so vibration like on the truck when it's being shipped. Yeah, right. They're being shipped on trucks. <laughs> They're subject to vibration. So immediately the gun's potentially unsafe. That's crazy. But that's going to uh, be a defense argument, right? Hey, it never went off during shipping. Hey, we never had a problem with the gun. Uh, we recognized that there was a potentiality for these types of issues once we, you know, it was reported to us. But we also recognized that that could have been due to negligence and user error. 
And But just as a precaution, we included this vibration language within uh, the scope of our new warning to make sure that uh, we were negating as much liability as possible and warning the users appropriately. So let me ask you this. I have a vague recollection from law school uh, about a uh, basically a, a, a legal policy that would say, all right, if a manufacturer becomes aware of a defect and they take efforts to fix the defect, you can't use their effort to fix the defect against them in That's court. True. Because as, as yeah. a matter of public policy, we don't want to disincentivize uh, someone who suddenly becomes aware of a defect to fix it. Yeah, that's true. No, you're remembering correctly. So you can you can uh, stave off some liability, in fact, by warning. And and a lot of it, it's always it then comes down to a marketing and business decision, right? If we if we put this warning on our label, is it going to disincentivize our our buyers from purchasing the product, right? So like if I know, for example, actually uh, the cancer warning on the labels from California, if I was a manufacturer there, or if I was selling products, I would move out of California in a heartbeat for various reasons. But that is actually one of the reasons I would leave because I, I don't need people to think that my product causes cancer. Right. It's implied it that it does, right? Yeah. So. There's always a business uh, marketing decision that has to be made there. But from a legal standpoint, you do want to include that warning language as a little bit of a barrier for yourself. Uh, here we have John Roberts, who I guess is in Europe, six euros. Thank you very much. Writes, if you vibrate enough to make a pistol discharge, you may want to stop using federal primers. <laughs> Some primers are easier to set off than others. Uh, Fred Pedamonti, $5. Thank you very much. There are, he writes, there are 500,000 P320s in the U.S. right now, only less, only less that Glock 1719. Um, I don't know. There could be 500,000 P320s. It's a very, very popular pistol. And it comes in a lot of different configurations. So it comes in very small sizes. I carried, I guess I'd call it the medium size. Then a full size, like for police officers. Then it has a extra large size, like for competition use. Very, very, um, versatile gun versatile in part because it has a somewhat unique feature um if you buy a glock the firing mechanism for the glock is molded into the plastic frame so the firing mechanism is the basically the serialized part it's the part that's legally a gun but they mold it into the frame so you can't separate the two items with the with the sig 320 and now their sig 365 xl which is what i currently carry you can pull the firing mechanism right out of the frame and put it in a different frame uh, so you can mm -hmm. buy a different shape frame, a different size frame, and you're not buying a new gun each time you do that. Only the firing mechanism is the gun. So it makes them incredibly uh, versatile pistols. I know that the 365 XL I carry for personal protection, I'm on my third grip module for it, a different type of grip module. Wow. Uh, every time I find a, a, one I like a little bit better, I buy it and just drop the whole gun into that grip module. Well, they always recommend it. They, I, it was recommended to me as a woman, and and my understanding is is that it's very popular for self defense for women, uh, because of that versatility. You can get a grip that's a little bit smaller. They, they, you know, design these smaller handheld weapons so that handheld weapons, all guns right. are handheld, but uh, you design these hand these handguns that women can get their hands around. Uh, generally, right. we have smaller hands, smaller fingers, so. So Brian, $5 Super Chat. We have just a couple left, uh, Danny, and then I'll let you go. Uh, have we determined if they were using holsters meant for the 320 or did they repurpose their Glock holsters and just jam it in there? And that's a good question. I'm sure mm -hmm. the defense will come up with this. Now I will note in, the, in this filing, uh, they do also allege somewhat in passing that the holster, so sometimes when you buy these 320s, they'll sell you kind of a kit. So you're getting the gun, You'll get a couple magazines, and sometimes they'll include like a cleaning brush uh, and a, a holster. Uh, and usually it's a pretty cheap-ass holster. It's not something I would ever carry. But That's it's a I good deal if you're a new yeah. gun owner. And, you know, you don't want to have to worry about buying a holster, too. It's nice to have the holster in there. Uh, and usually they're, they're okay. You know, they're designed for that particular gun. But if you try to put a gun in a holster designed for a different gun, uh, that can definitely have safety implications because parts of the holster may touch parts of the gun you don't want particularly the trigger. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm sure the defense will be exploring that as well. But the, in the filing here, they do allege that the holster provided by SIG with SIG 320 pistols was also itself inherently unsafe. Uh, and then Dragon's Treasure. Dragon's Treasure. We were just on with Dragon's Treasure. Mm -hmm. Hey, dude, I can't remember his real name, though. Uh, I The T-Man? That's what I remember. 
He has okay. a cat. Dragon's treasure. $5 <laughs> super chat. Thank you very much. He has a cat. Indeed. Uh, he writes, if my pit bull drops from my holster and accidentally mauls a child, how can I best sue the child's family? Ha ha ha. Very, very funny. <laughs> oh, for political reasons. No comment. Oh, that is hilarious, though. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think those are all the questions. Danny, we made it two hours. Can you believe how time flies when we're having fun? Thank you so much for coming on. Again, folks, you can find Danny. Her YouTube and her Twitter are linked in the comments below. Uh, take a look at her channel. Subscribe, like, follow her on Twitter. Do all those things. Let's let's get Danny to the next level on all this law tube stuff. We we need someone who does civil work. Oh, thank you. And yeah, I'm excited to share my ideas and uh, my review of cases and case law with you guys. Um, do be aware that nothing that uh, we said should or ever, ever should be construed ever. as legal advice because it is not. And uh, I am quite often wrong. Please feel free to correct me in the comments and I will issue a retraction and correct my statements and be aware that uh, I am a little hungover right now. So my mind is not operating <laughs> at full capacity. But thank you so much for having me on. I hope that it was a useful exercise and that uh, I had something to add. That was my main concern is because you're already so brilliant and understand all of these issues, regardless of whether or not that's your bread or butter, that I was going to uh, somehow mess this up. So thank you again for having me on. And hopefully uh, you'll have me on in the future. And hopefully you'll come and join me when I have a case that I'm reviewing that's of interest to you. Yeah, that would be awesome. And I'll follow up with you offline to uh, probably in an hour or so. I have to do some post-production work on the video to get you the download link so you can use it on your channel as well. Thank you so much. That's very generous. And yes, please come check out my channel. Watch all the way through the videos. Just have it playing in the background. You know, it's a lot of fun. That's what I do. I clean the house and I have it playing while I'm doing other stuff. And uh, it really helps us in the algorithm. It helps me get monetized and make money, which is my ultimate goal in life is to help educate, uh, entertain, and make lots of money while doing all of those things. So please, please like, subscribe, check out all of uh, all of Andrew's videos and his courses. And definitely, it sounds like this membership deal is a good deal. If you're interested in, in being engaged in a community uh, and learning more about these issues, definitely, I, I would. I'm going to get myself a membership. How about that? Yeah, we've, we've got lots of members. It's a very vibrant community and we, we lose nobody. So our attrition oh, is awesome. extremely low. So people like the experience. And it's 30 cents a day, folks. It's hard to go wrong, honestly. All right, Danny, thank you so much. Have a great remainder to your weekend. Uh, and we'll talk soon. Sounds great. Thank you so much. All right, folks, that is it for today's show. Uh, before we depart, I'll just remind all of you once again, if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun, so I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.